Hello, and welcome to a digital statistics lecture for Salt Lake Community College. In this video, we're going to be talking about section 7.2 for Math 1040, applications of the normal distribution. In section 7.1, we just finished talking about what the normal distribution was and how to work with it and how to talk about the probabilities that we will find. In this section, we'll talk about how to find those probabilities between any values in a continuous random variable. In order to talk about that, we need to remind ourselves what a z-score me uh, means, or a standardized normal random variable. A z-score, if you recall, the formula being right here, helps you find how far away a value is from its respective mean, at least in terms of how many standard deviations away it is. Um, the reason we talk about this is because when we make our normal curve, for example, uh, we if we have a normal curve somewhat, say, centered at... I don't know, a mean of 15, and I have a standard deviation of 2, so it increases up to 17, and then 19, and down to 13, etc., etc. This kind of curve, if we wanted to find the area between any two values, if I wanted to find this area here, what I would need to know is the actual formula that defines this curve itself. Now, that's a kind of a complicated uh, process, and a little bit uh, over the top of what we need to do. Because if we can verify that this shape is normal or it's bell-shaped or symmetric, then what that means is that we should be okay to compare it to what we call the standard normal distribution. That being the normal distribution with a z-score, um, so a normal distribution centered with z-scores, so a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. If we can compare it to that distribution instead, which has a relatively easy formula to work with and calculate, then we can more easily find the area between values by instead identifying how many z-scores away those values are. A little bit of an easier process than trying to find the definition of a full curve and then trying to find the values in between that, which requires a little bit of calculus. An example of this is shown on the next page. Here we have a histogram of data. This one has a mean of 100 and looks like a standard deviation of 20, maybe 15. Not sure if this is really spreading by standard deviation. It looks like it's probably a standard deviation of 15. Um, and we have compared to that the same information, however, represented with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. That being because this is representing their respective z-scores instead of their original data. The shape of the curve, the spread of the curve, everything is retained. Which means if I wanted to find the area from, say, this point to this point, I'd instead find the same respective values from this point to this point. That's all I need to do in order to find the area there. So a little bit easier. So that's the whole point of z-scores and what and why we're talking about them here. All right. Now, there are two methods in order to find this, in order to use z-scores to find the area of a normal distribution. You can either convert the normal random variable x to a standard normal random variable z, so use z-scores. Take those z-scores and work with the table that's going to be on page 5. Alternatively, we could also compute this area using a TI graphing calculator. Now, this is going to be our method. However, for this next example, I'm going to show both methods so you see how it would be done calculating the z-scores and the table 5, and how it's also going to be done with our calculator, which is going to be a little bit more accurate because it requires less rounding. All right. So in this example, we have a soda can dispenser has a mean fill volume of 12 ounces with a standard deviation of 0.12 ounces. We want to find the proportion of cans that have fewer than 11.9 ounces. All right. Now we talked about in 7.1 how we would set up these problems and knock them down. In terms of setting it up, what we would do is start to identify values on the x-axis, starting with the mean of 12. Now, personally, I recommend simply identify values that are important for you. In this case, I don't need to identify the standard deviations going above 12 because my only important value here is 11.9, which is below 12. 
So all I should really need to do is start to identify standard deviations below 12 until I reach or pass my intended value. If I go one standard deviation down from 12, so 12 minus 0.12, that should give me 11.88. So that's my value here, 11.88. Well, thankfully at this point, we've already reached my value of 11.9 or passed it. 11.9 being somewhere between 11.88 and 12. See if I can get that in red. There we go. 11.88 and 12. That, those are really the only values I need to uh, represent because I know where my value is in terms of how many standard deviations away it is. And I should have an idea of what kind of probability I'm looking for. Particularly here, since we're looking for fewer than 11.9, so I'm looking for the area below 11.9. Okay, so now that we have that set up, what we should be able to do now is work with the z-score, find the z-score for 11.9, and then find its associated probability using the table on page 5. So, first we find the z-score. Now to find the z-score, we take our value, 11.9, we subtract it from the mean of 12, and then we're going to divide that by the standard deviation of 0.12. If I do that appropriately, I can do that over here in my calculator. I could do 11.9 minus 12. That should give me a negative number. I'm expecting that because it's below the mean. And I divide that quantity by 0.12. Note that I have parentheses around those first two values, so they are subtracted first before I divide. Could also just do the first two uh, subtracted, hit enter, and then divide. Either way, we get a z-score of negative 0 0.83. Technically, it's 8.3 repeating, but you'll see in just a moment why I only round to two decimal places. With this z-score in mind, what I want to do is use that in table 5 in order to find the area. So let's look down in table 5. All right. So down here on table 5, this looks a lot more complicated than it really is. The margins here, if you see, the margins are defined by the variable z. The margins are trying to define a, a two decimal value of a z-score and tell you what the area, designated by the graphic, the area that is below that z-score. So if you remember, our z-score was negative 0.83. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to scroll down here, I'm going to look until I get to negative 0 0.8. So negative 0 0.8. Now I want negative 0 0.83, this only includes one decimal. The, ver the horizontal axis here will indicate your second decimal place. So we want to go until we get to 0.03. Together, negative 0.8 and 0 0.03 will give me negative 0.83. I can scroll down and narrow through and what I should get is my estimated probability right there. So I get an estimated probability of 0 0.2033. I have this probability of uh, x being less than 11.9 is approximately 0 0.2033 according to table 5. Now that's how we would use it using table 5, which isn't too bad. However, I, I tend to say that's a little archaic because if you notice, we rounded the z-score off, even though technically it was supposed to be 0.83 repeating. We rounded that off and then also the probability was rounded off, so there was a couple instances of rounding which leaves us to some lost values. What we're going to do is the calculator function as well that will give us a little bit more of an exact value. All right, so same kind of instance here. We have 12, we have 11.88, and we have our value of 11.9, and finding the area below that. So same instance. 
What we're going to show here is the, is the program that we're going to use to find this. Now if you recall in chapter 6 we were working with the binomial distribution and therefore we were in the distribution section of our calculator. In this section we're working with the normal distribution which means we're still going to be in the distribution section. In order to access that we're going to hit second we're going to hit the button VERS, which above that in blue for my calculator says DISTR. If you have an 83, it's probably an orange, which is why you still hit second. When you're in here, you see functions like normal PDF, normal CDF, inverse norm, etc., etc. Near the bottom there was where binome PDF and binome CDF were. However, here we're just working with normal distributions, so we only need the stuff at the top. Specifically, what we want is the function normal CDF. The reason that we want normal CDF is because we want to find the area of a range of values. Normal PDF is simply going to help me find the height of a value for uh, the height of a curve at some specific value which isn't really relevant. It, it's not really important for us. We tend to want area between values for continuous random variables. So we're always going to use normal CDF. There will not be a point in this class where we need normal PDF. If I hit normal CDF, I will notice that there are going to be four inputs. If you do not have an 84, you need to know what the four inputs are going to be. So one, two, three parentheses. The first input is going to be your lower bound. So the lower bound on the air, my shaded area here. If I notice, my area goes all the way down and continues down towards this arrow. It keeps going down. Which means that what I want as a lower bound here is going to be the value that's constantly going down and down and down. I'd want something even past zero, past negative 100, past negative 1,000. What I really want is negative infinity, because it should go on for infinity, as, as we talked about in 7.1 a few times. Unfortunately, negative infinity is a concept that is not a number, so we cannot plug it in physically. What we need is a proxy for infinity, a number that's far enough away from our values so that we can use it as something like infinity. In my calculator, if you've never used normal CDF before, it likely already has this negative 1 E99 there. What that means is negative 1 followed by 99 zeros. So on and on and on and on. It's a really, really large negative number. It's a really extreme negative number, I'll say. You can use that. Uh, that works perfectly fine. What I personally tend to use is just hit negative and then just hit the 9 button until I'm happy with myself. Enough of those 9s will be a big enough negative number that's a good proxy for infinity. So that's really all I need for my lower bound there since I'm going to negative infinity. My upper bound, however, on my shaded region is going up to 11.9. So 11.9 is going to be my second input. The last two inputs are always going to be the same. It's always going to be the mean and the standard deviation. And if you're doing multiple questions with the same information, then those should be consistent throughout, which makes it a lot easier to do multiple questions with this. Here, our mean was 12 and our standard deviation was 0 0.12. So that's what it should look like in our calculator with normal CDF. If you do not have the wizard, you should be writing down what I have written on the page here, normal CDF. Negative 9999, 11.9, 12, and 0.12. Once I'm done, I can paste that to the main screen and run it. And I should get an approximate area. Here I get 0 0.2023. And since we want it as a proportion, we can keep it as a decimal. So that's good. Note how close that is to our previous answer of 0 0.2033. Just a little bit off. That's because uh, the previous value had rounded off a little bit. It lost some information there, not too terribly much, but normal CDF is always going to be more accurate. Okay, so that's an example showing you how you would do it uh, with the old table or how you would do it with the TI graphing calculator. Moving forward, I'm going to do the rest of the problems using the TI graphing calculator. 
On page 8, we have the, the printout of a couple of the values for, or the couple of the uh, explanations of how to get the two formulas that we're going to have in this, in this section, so normal CDF and also inverse norm. We haven't talked about inverse norm yet. We will in a moment, so I'll talk about that when it comes up, which will be soon. So we'll, we'll come back to that. All right. Let's do this example here. The number of chocolate chips in an 18 ounce bag of Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookies is approximately normally distributed with a mean of 1,262 chips, the standard deviation of 118. We're gonna find the probability that a randomly selected 18 ounce bag contains between 1,000 and 1,400 chocolate chips inclusive. All right, now to do this, again, we're gonna follow through just like we did with the previous uh, few problems. We're gonna set up the problem, we're gonna graph it, see what it looks like, and then we'll find the probability of this. I always recommend for these cases to always draw a small picture. It doesn't have to be super detailed, but something so you can tell what the area should be or what the probability should be based on the empirical rule. So always draw at least a simple picture. It will help a lot and give you some good context of what it looks like. Here I have up top, I have 1262 as a mean. And I want to use values between 1000 and 1400. So that means I need to know where both of those are in relation to my mean. So 1,400, that's above 1,262. So if I go one standard deviation up 1,262, standard deviation being 118, I can go up to 1,380, which isn't quite where 1,400 is, but 1,400 is going to be just past that. So around there. If I were to add another 100, I'd go past 1,400. Now if I go down, if I go down one standard deviation, I get... 1,144, which isn't quite to 1,000, so that means I need to keep going. Another standard deviation down gives me 1,026, which isn't quite to 1,000, but 1,000 is right past that, so I'll just say 1,000 right here. Whoa, 1,000, not 10,000. And I want to find the area between those values. All right, so now that we have that graph, we should be able to use normal CDF to find this. So we have then, we have normal CDF. In this case, our lower bound is going to be the lower bound on our shaded region specifically, which is going to be 1000. So that's the lower bound on our shaded region followed by the upper bound in our shaded region, which is 1400. And then our mean 1262 and our standard deviation of 118. So we're gonna go to normal CDF and plug that in appropriately. So 1000 is a lower bound, 1400 is our upper bound. 1262 is our mean, standard deviation of 118. That should give us a probability of about 0.8657. Or since it does ask for a probability specifically, we'd say 86.57%. All right. So that looks good. If I try to estimate where these values are based on the empirical rule, I notice that 1,400 and 1,000 are more than one standard deviation away on both sides. So I expected this number to be more than 68%. 1,000 is a little bit more than two standard deviations, but 1,400 is not. So somewhere between 68 and 95 seems to make sense, so this number looks okay. For the second one, find the probability that the bag contains fewer than a thousand chips. That means that we're going to need to draw a new curve or at least replace what we we're drawing before. Here, since we have fewer than a thousand chips, we can still use where we designated a thousand before, but in this case, we're looking for fewer than that. So we're looking for the area below a thousand, which if you remember, does go all the way down to infinity, or in this case, negative infinity. So this one's going to be normal CDF. 
of uh, not 1,000. Our lower bound here is going to be negative infinity, up to an upper bound of 1,000. Then our mean of 1262, standard deviation of 118. What's going to be handy in these problems as you work through normal CDF, you'll notice that the mean and standard deviation will stay there, so 1262 is still there. You should just have to change the lower and upper bound if you're doing this same distribution multiple times. So the lower bound of negative infinity, which we'll use a proxy of negative 99999. An upper bound of 1,000. Since this is more than two standard deviations away, two standard deviations has a tail of 2.5%. I'm expecting something less than that, and I get an area of 0 0.0132 approximately, or 1.32%, which seems good. Thirdly, we have what proportion of 18 ounce bags contains more than 1,200 chips? Well, in this case, 1,200, I see 1,200 is right below 1,262 and uh, above 11, 8, 1,144, somewhere in the middle of that. So maybe up here, 1,200. And I want to find the area above that, but let me erase 1,000 real quick. So above 1,200, we're trying to find this region here. Note that this region eclipses the mean. So it includes the full half above the mean and more. If I recall, the mean splits the data in cleanly in half, so 50% should be above the mean, and this is a little bit more than that. So I'm expecting a value that's going to be more than 50% here, but let's see. In this case, when I run normal CDF, my lower bound on this graph is going to be 1200. It's going to be uh, the first value that I see on the shaded region, so 1200 up to an upper bound, in this case, of positive infinity, which will use another proxy, and the same mean and standard deviation. If I run normal CDF, the lower bound's easy, that's just the 1200, but then for my upper bound, what I'm going to use is a bunch of nines. Note that this is positive infinity, so there's no negative there, just 9999999. I run that, again, we're expecting something more than 50%, and we get 70.04%, or 0 0.7004, so 70.04%. Lastly, we have, would it be unusual to select a bag that contains fewer than 900 chips? So what that means is we need to think about where 900 is again, so I'm going to erase the values that I have here already. 900 is past 1,000, it's way past 1,000, so 900 is way over here, and we're trying to find the value fewer than 900. So this should look a lot like part B. However, this question was asking if it's unusual, and technically we should be able to do this without even calculating. Part B was from negative infinity up to 1,000, which had a small area of just 1.32%. That would be less than 5%, which would we, we would then consider unusual. Since that area was even bigger, I'm expecting that 900 is going to be smaller than 1.3 per 2%, so still unusual, but we should be able to confirm. So negative infinity up to 900, 1262 as a mean, 118 as a standard deviation. And we should get our value from that. So negative infinity or negative 9999 up to 900. Notice that I don't really use a consistent amount of nines, just enough of them to be a far enough number away. I usually do at least four or five. But we get here 0 0.0011 or 0.11 percent. That is less than 5% by quite a bit, so yes, this is unusual. So that's an example of working with a normal distribution problem. Now I'm going to continue. I'm going to work on the ones on page 9, 10, 11 as well. Um, but what I do recommend is try out page 9 first and see how you do on it. And then come back, uh, unpause the video, and see what you got. 
All right, so on page nine, we have the height of American adult women is distributed almost exactly as a normal distribution, which we need to know in order to work with this stuff. The mean height of adult American women is 63.5 inches with a standard deviation of 2.5. What we're going to do is find the probability that a randomly selected woman is between 68 and 72. Well, drawing that curve, 63.5 is in the middle. 68 and 72 are both above 63.5. So if I go up 2.5 inches, what I get is 66, which is not quite there. Up another 2.5 gives me 68.5. I seem to have eclipsed one of them. Up another 2.5 um, gives me 71. And 72 would be somewhere up there. So 68 to 72. Here, I'm expecting something, it looks like it's more than two standard deviations away, which would be 2.5%, probably. So maybe around 3, 4, or 5%, something like that. Although this chunk here tends to add a lot of percentage to it, so we'll see. Um, but I'm expecting something more than 2.5%. We'll see. All right. So to find that, we'll run normal CDF. We have a lower bound in this case of 68, an upper bound of 72 as given in the description. And then a mean of 63.5, standard deviation of 2.5. And if we run that in our calculator, we should be able to find our values. 68, 72, 63.5, and 2.5. That gives me an area of 0 0.0356. Again, it asks for a probability, so we're going to say 3.56%. Second one says, what is the probability, so again, the percentage, that a randomly selected woman is 70 inches or taller? Well, that means I'm going to erase the values that I have here and replace them with what I'm looking for here, 70 inches or taller. 70 inches is somewhere between 68.5 and 71, so somewhere here-ish, I'll say. That's where 70 is, and we want 70 inches or taller, so the area above. That means when we run normal CDF, our lower bound here is going to be that 70 value, followed by a upper bound of infinity, and the same mean and standard deviation for that distribution. So 70 infinity for my upper bound and what we get is 0 0.0047 or 0.47 percent which is rather unlikely both of these have been rather unlikely thirdly we have what is the probability that a randomly selected woman is shorter than 62 inches so again, what that means is that we're going to need to erase the values that we have in our distribution and find where 62 is. So 62 is somewhere between uh, below 63.5, so I'm going to go down a standard deviation. And if I go down 2.5, what I get to is 61, which is past 62. So we should be good to identify 62 to be somewhere between there. And we want shorter than 62, so that means we want the area below 62. Just looking at this, this is more than, uh, or this is uh, not quite one standard deviation away, and it has more area than just one standard deviation away tail. So I'm expecting something more than 16%, somewhere between 16 and 50%. If I run normal CDF on this, my lower bound is going to be negative infinity, followed by an upper bound of 62, a mean of 63.5, and a standard deviation of 2.5. So, negative 99999 for my lower bound, upper bound of 62, the same mean and standard deviation as before, and we get 0.2743, or 27.43%. All right, seems okay. It's more than 15%, less than 50, so 
everything seems like what I expected it to be. Okay, so for the last question. The last question asks, would it be unusual to select a woman that random that is less than 62 inches? Well, we just did that. Well, less than 62 inches was 27.43. It is not unusual since 27.43% is far more than 5%. So, no. This is not unusual. All right. I hope you tried that question on your own, and, and I hope that you did uh, well on those four. All right. So... On to the next page. All right, here we have the manager of In N Out Burger has determined that the wait times in the drive through are normally distributed with a mean of 2.3 minutes and a deviation of 0.42 minutes. Again, I recommend starting to try these questions, at least the first two on your own, see how you did. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do these uh, pretty quickly. I'm going to find out where they are and then just I'll work on the normal CDF on them. So 2.9, uh, that's above the mean of 2.3. If I go up 0.42 inches, uh, that gives me 2.72. 2.9 is going to be somewhere above that. It's not another standard deviation away. And we want the area above that. So that's going to give me normal CDF of 2.9 up to infinity. Mean of, of 2.3, standard deviation of 0.42. So that's going to give us 2.9 lower bound, bunch of nines for my upper bound, 2.3, and 0.42. Okay. That gives us a probability of 0 0.0766. So 0.0766. Again, ask for probability, so we'll say 7.66%. The second one says, what is the probability of customer's wait time is less than 2 minutes? Well, if I go down 0.42, I get 1.88. Yes. 1.88. 2 is somewhere between there. So 2 minutes is around there. And we want less than two minutes. So that's going to be normal CDF of negative infinity, 2, 2.3, and 0.42. You'll note that when I am sketching those, I'm not really doing it too carefully. I'm just trying to recognize where the number is relative to the mean so I can get an idea of what kind of value I should expect. Uh, we don't expect like super detailed ones with this, just enough so you know where the values are and you have an idea of what's going on. So, always recommended to draw a picture though. We get a probability of 0.2375 or 23.75%. Okay, so that was A. That was B. So, so far so good. Those two are just like the previous ones we've been finding, just running normal CDF. That's why we don't really need that much room there to find those. However, looking at this part C here. Part C says the shortest 40% of wait times are shorter than what time? That's a little different than the previous few. In all the questions we've ha had up to this point, we've been given a boundary. We've been given a boundary on a specific shaded region. In this, and we, what we were finding was the percentage for that. In this case, what we're given is the percentage for a shaded region. And we're trying to find the time. So we're trying to find the bound here. A little bit different. Since it says the shortest 40% of wait times are shorter than what time, that means I'm indicating the first 40%. Since I know up to the mean of 2.3 goes up to 50%, it would be below it. Somewhere around here might represent an area of 0.40 or 40%. And what we're going to try to find is this value here, the unknown time. 
at this point, what I know about it is that it's less than 2.3. <laughs> That's about it. It's it's less than 2.3. It's probably not one standard deviation away, so maybe between 2. Point, or 1.88 and 2.3 maybe. Um, but that's about it, at least up to this point. Normal CDF can't help us here because it would take a bound to find an area. What we're going to need instead is the inverse of normal CDF, which thankfully we do have a formula for. If we go back into second VARES where normal CDF was, we see right below that is a function called inverse norm. So that is going to find the inverse function that we need, the inverse of what we were just working with. Now, inverse norm for most calculators will ask for three inputs. If you have a fourth input, I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, the three inputs that inverse norm is looking for, firstly, is looking for area. So it's going to be looking for the area specifically to the left of your bound. That's very important, the area to the left of your bound. This bound that we're looking for, thankfully, we know the area to the left of it. We know the area to the left of it is 0 0.40. So that's going to be our area here. The last two inputs, since it only has three, are the mean and the standard deviation, so 2.3 and 0.42 respectively. Those are the only two points that I need, and I should be done with that. Now, if you have a fourth option here, on some calculators, it may give you a fourth option of tail or side or something like that. Um, what that means is that it will give you an option of which side does the area correspond to. Does it correspond to the left tail, the right tail, or possibly the center? Um, if you have that, then you're going to have a little bit of an easier time using these. And those are located on like really advanced TI-84s and above. Uh, if you don't have that, that's perfectly fine. Just make sure you know that it's always asking for the area to the left. Kind of works like binome PDF and binome CDF. If I get inverse norm, I get 2.19. And we still should be able to look at my graph and see if that makes sense because I knew it had to be below the mean of 2.3 and 2.9 seem or 2.19 seems okay. So, should always be able to look at the axis and see if the value that you got seems to make sense or not. Another example of this, the longest 25% of wait times are longer than what time? So, since we're looking for the longest 25%, that means we're looking for with the mean of 2.3 in the middle. We're looking for a value way over here, such that the area above it is 25%. I know it needs to be above the mean, because if I went from the mean and up, that area would be 50. I know it needs to be above the mean, because the mean and up, that area would be 50%. Whereas um, if I have only 25, that means I only have a portion of that full area. So I'm missing a good piece of it. So I know that it should be way above the mean somewhere. Maybe not way above, but should be above the mean. In this case, we should be able to use inverse norm yet again to find that area. So I'm going to use inverse norm. However, do be careful. We're not going to just plug in 0.25. The reason is because, again, inverse norm always wants the area to the left of your boundary. My boundary is right here. That's my x boundary. If 25% is to the right, that means, likewise, complementary, 75% or 0.75 is to the right of it. So that's what I'm going to have to use instead. So, 0.75 as my area, followed by my mean of 2.3 and 0.42. If I run that, I get second vars, 1, 2, get a lower, uh, nope, not 2, sorry. So, quit out of that second vars on inverse norm, which is the third one. 
uh, the area I want to the left is 0.75 in the mean of standard deviation. If you had that fourth option of which tail you want, you could put in 0.25 and then say that's the tail to the left, uh, or to the right rather, and that works perfectly fine. You should get the right area. We get here an answer of 2.58. That's 2.58 minutes. Again, we can note that that makes sense. We knew it had to be above the mean somewhere, so bigger than 2.3. Being 2.58 seems to be okay. All right. So that'll be our second function, inverse norm, if we need to find the boundary using an area. So, all these questions tend to be either you have a bound, find an area, or you have an area, find a bound. We're going to have a couple more, and then we're done with this section. Okay. So, uh, here on uh, page 11, looks like, yeah. Um, we have consider the IQ scores for a certain high school to have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. So using those two, what we're going to do is say a highly selective school only accepts applica applicants that are above the 75th percentile. So 75th percentile, very important. What we're going to do is draw the area to find the cut score. So we, uh, if we only want the people that are above the 75th percentile, we want to find what that cut score is. All right. So, 75th percentile. Remember, the 75th percentile, a percentile means uh, value such that the area below it, or in this case, to the left of it, is 75%. So, some value such that the area below it is 75%. That's what we're trying to find. Since we know the mean is 100, we're looking for a number above it. And since we are looking for a value and not a percentage, that means we are going to be using inverse norm. So that'll be inverse norm. In this case, the area to the left is given percentile. So we just have 0.75 followed by a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of, one, of uh, 15, not 115. So, second verse, we have the area of 0.75, that's what we had in the last problem actually, uh, 100 and 15. What we get is 110.12. So 110.12 points. That would be our cutoff score. Seems okay because it is above 100, so everything seems just fine for that. Secondly, we have what scores correspond to the middle 50%? Well, middle 50%, that's a little bit more complicated. That is saying that I want a value here and a value here such that the area in the middle corresponds to 50% of the data. Now, unfortunately, on most of our calculators, that's a little bit complicated to do. Uh, inverse norm is going to be not uh, the one solution. We need to do a little bit more than that, than just one inverse norm. If you do have the calculator that does say center, you can do that. That's fine. But for most of us, we do not have that, so we need to be careful here. We need to find both the lower bound and the upper bound for this region. The lower bound, we can find using inverse norm. However, we're not going to just plug in 0.5, because remember, if we want a boundary, we want the area to the left of it. So the area to the left of the lower bound here, if the area in the middle is 50%, then the other tails are each going to be 25%. So the inverse norm for the lower bound is going to be 0.25, 115. We just ran inverse norm, so there's not too much we need to change there, just 0.25 instead of 0.75. And what we should get is about 
Yeah. So approximately 89.88 points. For the upper bound, we would run inverse norm. However, in this case, the upper bound has 50% below it and another 25. So the upper bound has a total of 0.75 below it and a mean of 100 and standard deviation of 15, which we just did in the previous problem. So that's going to be an answer of 110.12 points. And that should be it. Okay. Now the third one is kind of difficult. The third question asks, how many students does the school need to enroll to have 500 with IQs above 120? All right, so that one's a little bit weird. So we need to find first how many, how much percent of the class will have an IQ that is above 120. Well, we have a mean of 100 here. Up one standard deviation would be 115, so 120 is just past that. So 120 is around there. And we want to find what this probability is going to be. In order to find that, we can use normal CDF because here we have a bound and we're trying to find an area. So what we have is 120 followed by an upper bound of infinity, mean of 100, and a standard deviation of 15. So if I run through that, 120, upper bound of a bunch of nines, 115, should get a probability less than 16%, yeah, about 9.12%. So we get about 0 0.0912. And now that's going to be the proportion of students that have an uh, IQ above 120. And the school wants to make sure that they have 500 students with an IQ of 120. So if this is the proportion of students, which would be the amounts of students with that quality over the total, that means the amounts of students with that quality would be 500 over the total that we do not know. So we can solve for n by multiplying both sides by n to get n times 0 0.0912 equals 500 and then divide both sides by 0 0.0912 to get n equals 500 divided by 0 0.0912 or approximately 500 divided by 0 0.0912. My calculator gives me about 5,482 students or if you round up 83. So I'll say about 5,483 students. at least. Notice that the question was asking for how many students have to be in the school so that only 500 of them, or at least 500 of them, have an IQ of 120. So we need to have quite a few students if only 9% of them have that IQ. So we're looking for about 5,483. Okay. It's so a little bit of a weird one, takes a little bit extra work, but more or less boils down to doing normal CDF and doing one extra step there. All right, last page. All right, I put a little bit of a star here because I feel like this is a kind of an important thing um, that you do need to be careful with. It's the notation for what we call Z sub alpha. So we read it as Z sub alpha. Now that notation is very specific, however, it will become far more important in a couple chapters when we get to chapter 9 and chapter 10. So keep this in mind. Uh, Z sub alpha is going to be defined as the Z score, so we're looking for a Z score. 
such that the area under the standardized normal curve to the right, very important, to the right of Z sub alpha is alpha. So for example here, we have Z sub 0 0.10. That means I'm looking for a Z score such that the area to the right of it is 10%. So I'm looking for a value maybe over here, z sub 0 0.10, where the area to the right of it is 10%, or 0 0.10. That means then we can find this value, which is a bound, by using inverse norm, and being careful to use the area to the left which if the area to the right is 0 0.10, the area to the uh, left is 0 0.90. So we're gonna say inverse norm of 0 0.90, that's my area. Furthermore, since this is a z-score under the standardized normal curve, our mean, so our mean is going to be zero, and our standard deviation is going to be one. That's the mean and standard deviation for a standardized normal curve. Well, we talked about the beginning of 7.2 today. If I run inverse norm on that, I get an area of 0.9. Mean and standard deviation are actually already set as zero and one. That's kind of the default if, you've, uh, if you did not just use inverse norm or normal CDF. And I get about 1.28 for my z-score. Seems to make sense. Uh, z sub 0 0.10, 10 would have to be somewhere above the mean of 0 itself. So I was looking for a positive z-score. Second one's another example of this. This one is z.27. Again, that's going to be over here on the right side of zero because it's an area that's less than 50%, it's just 27%. So maybe a little bit closer though, so I'll say around here is about Z.27. This area being 0.27 itself. Thusly the area, if that's the area to the right, the area to the left then is 0.73, which is the area that we will use in inverse norm. So 0 0.73, 0, and 1, because we're still working with a z-score, a standardized normal curve. So we have 0 0.73, 0, and 1. We're still expecting a positive z-score because it is above 0. And we get a positive z-score of 0 0.61, approximately. So 0 0.61. In most instances, we round z scores at two decimal places, so that's where I've been rounding it for these two, or it does always depend on the problem. With that said, that covers just about everything in 7.2. Just a lot of examples of working with normal CDF and inverse norm. However, hopefully you see these as not too bad compared to what uh, we had been doing in the previous sections. Uh, most students tend to see that chapter 7 and beyond are a little bit of the easier sections to work with. Uh, all right, so I, I hope that helps. Um, go ahead and work on the homework for section 7.2. And uh, if you need to rewatch this video, please do so. Uh, with that said, uh, have a good day.